Today we're going to talk about <laughs> some animal genomes and um, we're going to start focusing on dogs because they're really interesting and they're a familiar example so they're, they're uh, nice to look at because you already know a lot about dogs. Um, these are the questions we're going to address today. So. Um, what do animal genomes teach us about humans? Okay, one of the reasons animals are studied is because they're more like us than fungi or bacteria or plants. Um, and so they do have certain things they can tell us about our own biology um, that, is, uh, that has practical importance to us. What does genomics tell us about animal diversity? There are uh, millions of species of animals out there. We'd like to understand their diversity and how they, uh, how they all work. Um, and so genomics can contribute to that. And where did domestic dogs and cats come from as an example of how we can use DNA sequences to reveal the history of life? Um, and dogs and cats are really good examples of sort of a recent uh, historical event that a lot of fields can contribute to in terms of trying to understand their origin, including genetics, but also other fields like archaeology and anthropology. Okay. So I want to start by introducing you to a few organisms you might not have seen before. And the reason I want to do that is because these are animal species that are used a lot in um, genetics and genomics research nowadays. Um, they're so-called model organisms, and by model organisms we just mean that um, they're used very frequently in the lab. Um, they have certain advantages that make them convenient as laboratory animals. Um, and they're models uh, for uh, just sort of biology that is general. So uh, the reason we study them is not because we're particularly interested in specific species of fish or flies or worms or mice, but because we think they'll have something to say about all these other species that we're trying to understand, including ourselves. So um, you've seen flies before. Um, if, you're, if your eye is pretty good, you'll, you'll notice that this is a weird looking fly. Okay, it has four wings instead of two. And one of the things we'll talk about in an up upcoming lecture is how the discovery of this four-winged fly uh, led to a Nobel Prize for its discoverer, okay? Because this discovery basically had importance for understanding the development of all animals. This guy you might not have seen before. Um, it's grossly out of scale. So this looks like a giant snake compared to the fly, but this is actually only one millimeter long. It's a nematode worm called C. elegans. Um, fraction of an inch long. It's used a lot in the laboratory now for a variety of reasons. So one reason is that it has a very short generation time. So flies have a short generation time. It takes about 10 days to go from egg to adult in flies. Uh, these guys are even shorter. It's only a couple of days from egg to adult. That means genetics can proceed much faster because you need to go through all these life cycles to do your crosses. Um, other advantages of this organism are that it has a much smaller number of cells than Drosophila, even though it has very similar tissues. So like Drosophila, these guys have a nervous system, they have a gut, they have all the sort of basic uh, uh, physiological systems you'd expect an animal to have. Um, but they only have 959 cells, exactly, 959 cells. A fly probably has well over 100,000 cells. Okay? So understanding the biology of this creature is a lot easier than understanding the biology of that creature. Um, and there's some hope that we can study an animal and understand e exactly what each of its cells is doing. The other convenient feature of these nematode worms is they eat bacteria. And so you can grow them in a, in a similar way as you grow bacteria, either on a plate, like you've done uh, and seen, um, or um, in liquid culture. So the same material that's in those uh, agar plates, you can just put in a flask and shake and bacteria will grow very happily in there, and because bacteria are growing happily in there, nematodes will grow even more happily. Um, and so you can grow up a large, large number of nematode worms very quickly. Um, and so that's convenient for doing various uh, kinds of bi biological experiments on them. Um, some of these other guys. So these are uh, zebrafish, right? So small, small fish, uh, common in sort of home aquariums. Um, they're sometimes referred to as the, the fly of vertebrates. Okay, so fish obviously are vertebrates. They're more like us than a fly is. They have you know, a, a spine and a backbone and, and, and real bones like we do. Um, and zebrafish are a common laboratory organism uh, 
because they're closer to us, but they're very easy to raise in large numbers, and you can study them uh, and do genetics almost as conveniently as you can with, say, flies. Anyone know what these fish are? Puffer fish. What, what are they famous for besides puffing up? <laughs> for killing a few people each year because, when you, because it's a delicacy to have sushi made out of these guys, right? Um, and um, they're poisonous. One of, the reason, you know, one of the reasons they puff up is to warn predators that they're this puffer fish, right? And predators get used to not eating them because if they do, they die. Um, sushi lovers still eat them. Right? And if, if the chef who prepare, prepares it is not good enough, then you get some of that toxin in there and, and, and you die. Um, if, you, if it's prepared properly, it still get, gives you like a tingle in the mouth from the, I don't know if anyone's ever had fugu. It gives you like a tingle in the mouth because the toxin is not killing you, but it's you know, setting off the same kind of reaction. Why would anyone in their right mind want to study one of these in the laboratory, right? Uh, seems like kind of a stupid thing to do to say, okay, I just gave you the advantages of these guys. They're easy to raise in large numbers. They're you know, convenient to handle. Um, <coughs> why would you want something that's going to potentially kill you in the laboratory? Um, the reason is, is a surprising one that these guys, for whatever reason, have a very small genome compared to other vertebrates. So our genome, as you know, is 3 billion um, base pairs long. Um, Zebrafish genome is at least that big. Mouse genome is almost that big, okay? And that makes it hard to study. The, the, the Fugu genome, as you see on the next slide, is actually quite small. It's almost 10 times smaller than our genome, even though it has the same number of genes. And so for that reason, it's very convenient to study because um, you have this very compact genome, um, and all of the sequences in it are basically functional. There's much less junk in the Fugu genome than there is in our genome. Okay, and mice are obviously a very important laboratory organism and have been for a really long time. Um, again, they're used a lot in genetics because it's easy to cross different mouse strains together at will. Um, a lot of the techniques for um, sort of reproductive biology, in vitro fertilization, things like that are first developed in mice because their embryos are very similar to our embryos. Um, and they're, they're sort of the model mammal that's studied the most. Um, and, and, and as you know, you, you can sort of get closer and closer to us. And for some studies, primates are used um, in medical research, you know, um, uh, apes and, and monkeys of various types. Um, but for most sort of research at the genetic level that involves mammals, it's happening in, in mice or sometimes rats. So now, let me now just give you a summary of what these genomes are like, because that's sort of what we're interested in. Um, human genome, as you know, has about 3,000 million um, bases, 3 billion bases, and about 30,000 genes. The mouse genome is, is pretty much the same as ours uh, in size. And my laser pointer just died, so I'm going to keep pointing with my arm. Um, about 30,000 genes, and only a little bit smaller than our genome, 2,500 <coughs> bases instead of million bases instead of 3,000 million bases. As I said, the Fugu genome is really small, okay? It's only 400 million bases, but the same number of genes, okay? So what's missing in the Fugu genome is it has smaller introns, it has smaller spacing between genes, and it has far fewer repeats than our genome, okay? And that's why, even though it has the same number of genes, um, it's much smaller than our genome. The other two species I showed you, the fly and the worm, have small genomes. So the fly has about 180 million bases, the worm about half as big, 97 million bases. But, but look, those are only about, so the fly is only about half of the size of the genome of, of fugu. Um, so it doesn't take a, a much bigger genome to make a vertebrate than it does to make a fly. And in fact, um, some invertebrate species have much bigger genomes than vertebrates. Flies and worms have on the order of 15 to 20,000 genes. Um, and what I want to point out next is that the genes that they do have are not completely different from our genes. In fact, there's a big overlap in terms of what genes we have, what genes a mouse has, what genes a fish has, what genes a worm has, what genes a fly has. 
And that, in a way, is what justifies studying flies and worms to understand our own biology. Right? If they had completely different sets of genes, um, then it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to study them if what we were really interested in is understanding ourselves. But this is what the overlap is like. So if you compare the human genome and the mouse genome, and just say at the level of the gene, how many genes that you find in humans do you also find in mice? The answer is about 99%. Okay? That doesn't mean the sequence is identical. Right? As you saw last time, you know, we use slight differences in the sequences to actually tell how closely related organisms are to each other. Um, but gene by gene, you know, a gene that we have, basically a mouse has also. There are very few genes that we have that a mouse doesn't have. Fish, um, big overlap, but more differences. So about 75% of the genes we have, a fish has. Um, flies and worms, it's about 50%. So about half the genes that, uh, that we have, a fly or a worm, also has. Okay? And that's what makes them really good models for us to study. So if, if you think about these, so what kinds of genes do you think um, we have that a fish doesn't have? Or maybe an easier question, what kinds of genes do we have that a fly doesn't have? What do you think that missing part is? Skin. Skin. <laughs> uh, possibly. Although, um, even though the exoskeleton of a fly is very different from sort of our covering, um, a lot of the genes involved in sort of wound healing are actually the same in flies and, and, and us. Um, so there's actually some conservation. There's some similarity between fly genes and human genes in terms of sort of how we how we cover ourselves. Um, what else? Yeah. So our nervous system is exactly well said. Our nervous system is more complicated than theirs. Our brain is more complicated than theirs. And there are a lot of genes that are involved in brain development and brain function that we have that flies don't have. Flies do have brains, they do have central nervous systems, um, but it's a lot less complicated. Um, what else? There's, a, there's another big category that we have um, that flies and worms don't have. Bones, yes. Um, although again, those just, I mean, there's no reason you would know this ahead of time, but um, the genes that are involved in bone development are involved in other things, and, and we tend to share those genes. Yeah. Walking. Um, yeah, so again, I mean, th if you think about walking, right, it, what would the genes involved in walking be? They'd be central nervous system genes, right, because in terms of coordinating the, the movement, uh, muscle genes, which flies and worms have, and skeletal genes that we have. Um, any other guesses? So one real, yeah. Different organs. Um, definitely, definitely. And in fact, one of the, one of the um, big differences that makes up a lot of the difference actually is our immune system. Okay, so we have what's called adaptive immunity. We make antibodies. We have specific cells that attack foreign invaders that invertebrates don't have. Okay, and so a lot of the genes that um, are missing here are involved in uh, sort of antibody production and making these special um, immune cells. Uh, and, and obviously there are organs devoted to that uh, as well. Okay, so that's just sort of to get you started thinking about these genomes. Um, the nice thing about genomics is that um, it's not limited to model organisms that people have studied for a long time. Okay, so um, there are non-model organisms that are now, now becoming really interesting to study um, that are, um, you know, things you would not expect. So this is one example. Um, it's a stickleback fish. It's called a three-spine three stickleback because it has these spines on its back. Um, but some, some of these fish do and some don't, okay? And I just want to draw your attention um, to the part of your required reading for today is uh, from this booklet called The Genes We Share with Yeast, Flies, Worms, and Mice. Um, so this is sort of the theme we're talking about now. This is a PDF that's online for you. Um, and so this go goes through some of the examples of the model species like worms and flies and mice, but it also goes into species like this. 
Um, and it goes, and not all of the articles in here are required, but I recommend that you take a look at them. There are interesting things like um, um, these scientists uh, at UCSF who study uh, drunk flies. Okay, they use flies as a model for understanding alcoholism, um, and I don't know whether it feels good or bad for those flies. Um, <laughs> Um, so I encourage you to read that. And, and one of the examples in that booklet is these uh, stickleback fish. Um, and the sticklebacks are a model of diversity. So um, as I was saying, that not all of them have these three spines. And in fact, you can see how different this fish is from that fish from that fish, both in pigmentation and in the sort of skeletal structure. Um, originally, and there are over 100 varieties. That look, that look different from each other, but are still sticklebacks. And originally, they, they were thought to be different species, but they're actually all members of the same species. So in terms of diversity of appearance within a species, sticklebacks have most species B. Okay? And the reason um, that they have most species B is that in very recent times, they went through an amazing radiation into new environments. Okay? And, and uh, this happened at the end of the last ice age, so about 18,000 years ago. Huge uh, ice cap covered uh, the northern part of, of the United States and up into Canada. Um, and it gradually, as the ice age ended, it was gradually receding backwards. Okay? It looked like this. Okay? So this is about the time that um, Long Island forms. Okay? Uh, which is basically the garbage dump of the glacier as it as it receded, okay. Um, and what what you can see happening here is that um, you start with this big ice cap, which is in some places almost a mile thick, okay. And as it recedes, what you should notice happening is, for example, the Great Lakes appearing, um, all of these little inlets on the coast appearing, okay. And so there were these fish out in the ocean that were able to now colonize these new areas. And when they did that, they became new isolated populations. And this is one of the drivers of diversity. So when you have these isolated populations that are cut off from one another and that are entering, especially when they're entering a new environment that nothing else has colonized yet, um, there's an opportunity for them to adapt to that environment um, over generations and become very different from each other. And that's what happened with stickleback. So each of these little um, inlets here and here uh, became a new environment for the sticklebacks to enter. And that's why you get all these different varieties in sticklebacks. You still have the ocean species, which is pretty um, much more uniform over its range. But in these areas, um, it's become very different. And we'll get back to this in, in an upcoming lecture. Because there are some interesting genetics going on in terms of how these fish adapted to these new environments. But the species I want to focus on is another real incredible model for diversity, and that's dogs. Okay? And so um, the dog on the left is actually a wolf. right? Um, and as we'll see in a second, all dogs, all dogs that we know and love, evolved from a gray wolf um, sometime in the recent past. And we'll talk about how we know that. Um, but again, I don't have to remind you how different different dogs are from one another. And again, they're all the same species. Okay? And we know that because you can get them to mate with each other, uh, which they will happily do. And, um, and you know, they have offspring. So um, the question I want to deal with uh, today is not necessarily where all these different breeds come from, but how do we know where dogs as an entire species come from? That is, wh what is the origin of um, dogs? And we can tell that from their genes. And there were ideas floating around um, from archaeology, from anthropology, about where dogs came from. But it's really the genetic evidence that sort of nails the case shut. So just to remind you, we can use DNA sequences to figure out what dogs are related to and how they're related to each other. And we've gone through this before, but I just want to, and you've done it again on the midterm, but I just want to sort of refresh your memory about how this works. If you have sequences from the same gene in a bunch of different individuals, of different species or the same species. You can line them up. You can identify the sites that are not different and ignore those because they don't give you any information about the history of those organisms. And then you focus on the ones that are, in fact, um, different from each other. And that allows you to find 
the, the individuals that have the closest sequence and those are the most closely related. And so we went through this exercise in class uh, last week. And you know that if you, if you count up the differences between these sequences, you can figure out the relationships and they're like this, that you know, individuals two and five are closely related, three and four are closely related, and that this group of individuals is distantly related from that group. And so that's a general technique that works with, with any organisms you care about. Um, and so we can use it on dogs and wolves and other dog-like things to figure out whether, for example, we get all the dogs closely related and then the next thing that's closely related to them is a wolf or something else. Um, and we'll go through uh, the actual experiments that did that. But before we do that, I want to re remind you of something else you learned, which is that all of our cells and all of a dog's cells and a wolf's cells um, have these mitochondria inside of them. Okay, these are the um, energy producing organelles of the cell. And the mitochondria, because they arose from an endosymbiotic event, still have their own DNA. Okay, they don't have a lot of genes left, but they do have some genes left. Um, and so um, if we look closer at the mitochondria, um, they have this interesting organization. So this is an electron micrograph of a, of a cross section through a mitochondria. They have these sort of big folds in here. And anytime you see something in biology with a lot of folds like this or, or finger-like projections, it usually means they're trying to maximize surface area to do something, okay? So like your digestive system has a lot of these uh, microvilli in it to sort of maximize surface area. Um, and so um, what's going on in the mitochondria is on these membranes is where all of the important um, reactions go on to, to make energy. And so we don't need to go into detail about the structure of the ribosome, but um, the one thing I do want to point out is that there is DNA inside the ribosome. The, the uh, sorry, mitochondria. Wherever I said ribosome, I meant mitochondria. Um, so that DNA is my, what's called mitochondrial DNA, um, and it's inherited in a, in a very special way. So the mitochondrial DNA is actually not that big. It's a circle like a plasmid, okay? Um, and it's only around 15,000 bases long, okay? Again, like a plasmid. It's not much bigger than you know, a typical plasmid like the plasmid you, you worked with already in lab. Um, and it has typically in all animals around 37 genes, okay? And these are the genes that it has. It has 13 protein coding genes and it encodes various enzymes with complicated names like NADH dehydrogenase and cytochrome oxidase. And these are basically the machinery for making energy. Okay, you need these en uh, enzymes to, to do that. And then it also makes these ribosomal RNAs that are components of its ribosomes um, and transfer RNAs so it can do translation, right? And then um, we can look at where these genes are on this map of the mitochondrial DNA, and they're, you know, they're all around. And then there's this one extra region that's in gray here that's called the control region. And that's basically uh, similar to an origin of replication in bacteria. So um, that region is required for the mitochondrial DNA to be copied. And obviously, whenever a cell divides, its mitochondria have to duplicate and therefore have to replicate their own DNA. And that control region is required for that replication, um, but its specific sequence isn't as constrained as, say, the sequence that corresponds to an enzyme, right? Because an enzyme has to code for, you know, the, the DNA that codes for an enzyme has to have the codons with the amino acids coded for it properly. Um, but this control region has sort of looser constraints on it, and, and that's going to be useful uh, for us, and I'll show you why on the next slide. The other thing I want to point out is that mitochondria are only inherited from your mother. Okay, whether you're a human or a dog or a wolf or whatever. And the reason is that if you think about an egg and a sperm, okay, eggs have lots and lots and lots of cytoplasm. Mitochondria live in the cytoplasm. Okay? Sperm are basically just a nucleus with a tail. Okay? And so they have very, very, very little cytoplasm and therefore no mitochondria. So when a sperm fertilizes an egg, the fertilized egg and, there, and then the embryo you get got all of its mitochondria from its mother, okay? That means that this DNA is inherited only maternally, okay? And therefore, it allows us to, to track maternal lineages, okay? We can track who is whose mother, 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 all the way back, okay? If we wanted to track who is whose father all the way back, what DNA would we use? 
the Y chromosome. Okay, so we now have these tools, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA, that we can use to track maternal lineages and paternal lineages. Okay. So as I was saying, the control region um, is required for the replication of the mitochondrial DNA, but it doesn't have a, as strong a constraint on what that sequence needs to be. And therefore, it changes more rapidly than the parts of the mitochondrial DNA that are coding for enzymes. Okay, that is, it evolves rapidly. And that makes it useful for studying evolutionary relationships among closely related organisms because mutations accumulate quickly in this region. If you are studying a gene that encodes an enzyme that's really, really important, it's not going to accumulate very many changes over time. And so if you compared that sequence in dogs and wolves and whatever else, you might find zero differences among all of those sequences. Okay? Whereas a sequence that's free to change more can actually tell you relationships between you know, different dogs, dogs and wolves, and so on. Does that make sense? That different parts of our DNA change at different rates. OK. The other thing you should know about mitochondrial DNA is that um, it's interesting to study in its own right, because there are lots of mutations of mitochondrial DNA, that is, base changes that occur in humans sporadically, um, that cause disease. Okay? And so what this is is a map of human mitochondrial DNA and the arrows point to known base changes that were found in certain individuals, patients with certain diseases. Okay? And there are a load of them okay, in all of these genes, basically, that lead to various diseases. Um, respiratory deficiencies, myopathies, um, anemia, uh, cardiomyopathy, um, deafness, deafness. Uh, encephalopathy, myopathy, cardiomyopathy. So uh, myopathy is a sort of um, muscle problem. Um, cardiomyopathy is a problem with the muscle that is your heart. Um, why do you think these kinds of diseases, uh, you should have gotten the impression, right, that, uh, that there are certain types of diseases that are caused by mutations in mitochondrial D DNA. Why do you think those kinds of diseases are caused by problems with your mitochondrial DNA? Yeah, because basically what happens when you have a mutation in one of these is, is your energy production is impaired. And so the organs that require the most energy are the ones that are affected. Okay? For example, your muscles. Every time a muscle contracts, it takes energy. Okay? Um, and so therefore, you get problems with your heart muscle, which obviously is beating all the time, hopefully, um, and other muscles. Um, and so these diseases of the mitochondrial DNA are interesting in their own right. But for the purposes of this lecture, what we're interested in is how to keep the computer plugged in and how to use these mitochondrial DNA sequences to actually figure out where dogs came from. OK? And So you can already guess sort of how we do that. We go out and we get a bunch of DNA from a bunch of dogs and a bunch of putative relatives of dogs. Okay? And so uh, some of you can probably recognize the various dogs on here. We have a, um, a Bedlington Terrier. And if you go clockwise around, we have a Belgian Sheepdog, a Cocker, Cocker Spaniel, a Collie, a Doberman Pinscher, Flat-Coated Retriever, Gray Wolf. Pekingese, Newfoundland, Mastiff, Akita, Basset Hound, and so on. OK, so you all know that dogs are really variable in their appearance. It's, it's, it's in a way hard to believe that this guy and this guy are a member of the same species, right? Um, and then the question is, what was the ancestor of all these things like? Um, and our best guess going in is that it was a wolf, OK? So the question we want to ask is, from what wild ancestor did dogs arise? Okay, what, what was the domestication event that give, gave rise to all dogs? Okay, what was the animal that was domesticated? This, in general, is a very hard question to ask because we don't have access to this ancestor. This ancestor lived sometime in the past and died. Okay, and so, um, in general, um, you know, despite the efforts of archaeologists to dig up remains of various things and study them, we, we will never 
have access to the ancestor of all dogs. So what we need to do is figure out some way to infer what that ancestor was like uh, based on things that are living today. Okay? And the way we do that as geneticists is we say, well, we can't get this, but what we can get is the most similar living relative of dogs. Okay? And if we get the most si similar living relative of dogs, then we can infer that the thing that was domesticated was like that. It was an ancestor of that as well. Okay, so the question we ask is, uh, what is dog's closest living relative? Okay, and as I said, the best guess going in is wolves, but there are other guesses as well, like coyotes and jackals. Okay, and so data are obtained. Okay, so you go and you get a bunch of dogs and you swab their cheeks. You know how that works now, right? Um, and what, what this first study did was they got 140 samples from 67 different dog breeds. Okay. They also got, since wolves were the best guess, they, they got 162 samples from wolves that came from all around the world. Um, they probably didn't do it in the same manner. <laughs> they had five coyote samples, and they had 10 jackal samples, OK? Because those are also canids. They're, they're dog-like animals um, that are living today, OK? From each of these samples, they sequenced 261 bases of mitochondrial DNA from the control region. Okay? So they have these 261 um, bases that they can then line up and see which ones are most similar. Okay? The first really interesting finding is that even though they sequenced 140 dogs, they only got 26 unique genotypes. That is, only 26 sequences are actually different from one another, and the rest are just repeats of one of those 26 sequences. Okay? So that tells you even for a relatively rapidly evolving piece of DNA, um, the most probable thing when you compare two dogs is that they don't have any differences between them at all. Okay? That tells you how recent the origin of dogs is just by itself. Okay? That over the thousands of years that uh, these different dog breeds have been diversifying, um, for the most part, they didn't obtain any mutations in this little piece of DNA, okay? although 26 different types did emerge. Similar thing is true of the wolves. Okay? If you compare the 162 wolves, there were only 27 unique genotypes, and the rest were just repeats of one of those. Okay? So again, that says that wolves are all fairly closely related to each other. Okay. As I said, the next thing you want to do is then line up all of these sequences. And you do it in exactly the way as I did on that cartoon slide where we only had six sequences. Okay? And so what's shown here is the data set you get after you eliminate all the positions that are not different. Remember I said they, they sequenced 261 bases, but only these positions, and there are about, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them, had any differences where one, at least one of the individuals is different from the rest. Okay, all of the other parts of that sequence are exactly the same in all dogs and all wolves. Okay? And so when we, when we draw this, when we have a lot of sequences that we're looking at, um, it's often convenient to put dots where things are the same as some reference sequence. So if you look at top W12, so all the Ws are wolves and all the Ds are dogs. Okay? So if you look at W12, its sequence is actually written out from start to finish. And wherever one of these guys has the same sequence, so like W21, um, in that fir first position where W12 is an A, W21 is also an A, and so we just put a dot, because sometimes it's hard to just scan down and see that it's A, 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 whereas a dot is easy to see, and we just say, OK, that matches the one up there. Okay? But what you can see is this set of dogs has a G in this first position instead of an A. Okay? So that's what allows you to start saying, OK, maybe these, this set of dogs is different in some way from the rest. right? Um, but if you had to go through, and, and so that's what's true of all of these positions, if you had to go through by eye and then draw an, an evolutionary tree from these sequences, it would be very hard, right? Because you'd have to count up all the differences. You have to say, well, which one goes next to which one? When you have six sequences with only a few letters each, that's fine. But when you have you know, many sequences with 40 letters each, then it's hard. And so you just stick it into a computer, and the computer figures it out for you. And you get a tree like this. So this is the, the, I just want to emphasize, that's the actual data. This is the actual tree that you get from those data. Okay? So this is the paper that 
that, that got this result. Um, it's not a cartoon anymore. This is real. Okay? And the first finding, which is a really important finding, is how different all the wolves and the dogs are from coyotes. Okay? So the coyote sequences are so different that if you compare any dog with the coyote, there are at least 20 different mutations that, that are different between them. 20 different bases are different between them. Okay? So that by itself, and you can see on the rest of the tree we have Ds and Ws. So the dogs and wolves are all up here, and any one of those is very different from a coyote. Okay? And the same is true of jackals. Okay? So the point is that that result by itself pretty much says that the wolf is the ancestor of, of modern dogs, and it wasn't the coyote, and it wasn't the jackal, because you get a very similar result from the jackal. Okay? The other thing we notice about this tree, we're sort of going through how you, how you actually look at a tree like this and interpret it, is that the wolf sequences are actually interspersed with dog sequences. Okay? So there are Ws down here and Ds down here. There are Ws down here and Ds down here. There are Ws here and Ds there. Okay? So that, again, suggests that, that the difference between a wolf and a dog isn't that great at all. Okay? There, in some cases, and this is amazing, what's shown here is W6 and D6. So wolf number six and dog number six actually have the same exact sequence. Right? What that means is if that's all the DNA you have, if I give you a tube with 261 base pairs of control region DNA, okay, and it was uh, this sequence, you wouldn't be able to tell me if it came from a dog or a wolf. Okay? If you have the whole genome, you could probably tell me. Okay? But for part of the genome, at least, it's, it's impossible to tell whether you have a wolf or a dog. That's how closely related dogs and wolves are. Okay. The next thing we notice is that um, just by doing this analysis, because wolves and do dogs are so closely related, we can't really tell breeds apart. Okay? What you might expect is if the breeds are really ancient, let's say poodles were made you know, 10,000 years ago and German shepherds were made 10,000 years ago by breeding and you know, some other dog was made that long ago, that you would have a little like, cluster on the tree that was all poodles and a little cluster on the tree that was all German Shepherds and a little cluster on the tree that was all Cocker Spaniels or whatever. But that's not the case. So if you look at where the German Shepherds are, there's one up here, one down here, and one that's the same as the wolf. Okay? So this region of DNA doesn't allow us to, say, uh, identify a breed the same way it doesn't really allow us to identify whether it's a dog or a wolf. Okay? So just by doing this, and, and next lecture we'll see that you can actually do better and you can actually identify breeds. With, with better data. Okay? So this analysis can't discriminate breeds, but it gives very strong evidence that the gray wolf is the dog's closest relative. Okay? Um, the other thing it suggests is that because the wolf sequences and the dog sequences are sort of interspersed the way they are, that there are several lineages of wolves that contributed to dogs. That is, there wasn't just one origin with a single wolf that was domesticated and all dogs came from that. Because if that were true, then you would expect to see all the dogs clustered together on the tree coming off a branch that had one wolf sequence associated with it, basically, or, or a few related wolf sequences. But instead, what you see is wolf sequences and then a few dog sequences that are related to it, wolf sequences and then a few dog sequences that are related, wolf sequences and then a few dog sequences that are related, <coughs> suggesting that a few female wolves contributed to the diversity of dogs that we see today. And I say female because this is all from mitochondrial DNA. So we're tracking the female lineages. And then, as I said, this analysis by itself does not discriminate breeds, but we'll, in an upcoming lecture, we'll talk about how we can actually do a DNA test, basically, and say, OK, that's a poodle. Or that's a Basenji or something else. Okay. Since that original study was done, a, a bigger study was done to try and be a little bit more specific about the origin of dogs. Okay. And so the new study was pretty much the same as the old study, except it was bigger. So um, what they used was 582 bases instead of 281. And they used 654 dogs and 38 wolves, so a lot more dogs. Okay. And basically, after going through all that trouble, they were able to confirm the previous result, okay, which is not too surprising. 
Um, but they were able to tell two new things that are really interesting. So one is that they were able to figure out when the domestication of dogs occurred. Okay? And they estimated the origin of domestic dogs to have occurred around 15,000 years ago. And this makes sense from the ar archaeological and anthropological evidence um, because um, at about that time, right, maybe a little bit after that time, is when civilization starts and people are moving to population centers and maybe having pets and, and dogs that can do work for them, like retrievers and so on. The other interesting thing is that if you have enough sequences, you can tell where the domestication happened. Because again, what you expect on a tree like this is that the most closely related thing is going to share the most recent ancestor with the ones you're interested in. Okay? And if you can identify what that most closely related wolf is, um, then you might be able to say where on the planet that domestication event happened because wolves show s some amount of geographic distribution. So they, you know, wolves populations in North America are a little bit separate from wolf populations in Europe and in Asia and so on. And so if you sequence a bunch of wolves from North America, Europe, Asia, and you sequence a whole bunch of dogs, you can ask, well, which population of wolves is the descendants of the ones that probably gave rise to all the dogs. And the one that's closest um, are wolves that come from East Asia. Okay, So just from the genetic evidence, we now have uh, a firm answer to the question, what was the ancestor of all domesticated dogs? It was wolves. We have an answer to the question, approximately when did domestication of dogs take place? The answer is about 15,000 years ago. And we have an answer to the question, where did that take place? It took place in East Asia. Okay? I just want to say one word about where this number 15,000 years ago comes from. Okay? Obviously, DNA doesn't have a digital clock in it. right? It doesn't say, I'm 15,000 years old. Um, so how do you actually get a number like that? The way you do it is you calibrate the, the number of DNA differences you see with something from the fossil record. Okay? And so what was known is about a million years ago lived the common ancestor of coyotes, wolves, and dogs. Okay? And the reason we know that is because there are fossils that come from sediments that are about a million years old that look like something like this. And if you're a good uh, paleontologist, um, you can tell that an animal like this has the features of all of these things, okay? and that nothing looking like that specifically, that specifically, or that specifically came until more recently. Okay? So that dates, that's a way of dating the common ancestor of all of these things. And it's always an approximation, but um, you can, and that's why I draw it as sort of a band. Okay? But that's approximately a million years ago that the common ancestor of these canids lived. Okay? And then what you do is you say, well, how many DNA differences are there um, between, say, a wolf and a coyote? Okay? And how many differences are there between all the dogs that are living today? Okay? And what you find is if you take the two most different dogs in terms of DNA sequences, and compare that to, say, a dog and a coyote, or a wolf and a coyote, you find that there are si about 67 times more DNA differences between a coyote and a wolf than there are between the two most different dogs. Okay? And if you divide a million by 67, you get 15,000. Okay? So it's basically a calibration. You take this million years, and you assume that the DNA changes are sort of ticking off in a regular fashion. Okay? And so in the time it took to get to coyotes and wolves, 67 times more DNA changes took place than from here leading to all the different dogs. And that's, uh, that's how we know that dogs are about 15,000 years old. Okay? And you can do that at various scales of time. Okay? You just need to have the DNA uh, sequence that's changing at an appropriate rate. And you can do this timing. It's what we call now the molecular clock. Okay? There's not a real clock in DNA sequences, but there's this molecular clock that gives us information about um, how long ago things happened. Okay? And that's how you know, we, we can sort of infer um, and, and confirm 
how long it's been since we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees, with orangutans, with mice, and so on. Cats are another really interesting example. Okay, and so um, the same exact methods were used more recently. So this is uh, only a couple of years ago to figure out the relationships between uh, domesticated cats and um, and their wild relatives. Okay, and so uh, cats are a little bit more complicated than um, than uh, dogs, and the reason is that um, there are different types of wild cats that are related to each other that could have been the ancestor of, of uh, domesticated cats. So um, I just want to introduce you. Okay, so, so these two are domesticated cats. Those are house cats. Um, this one is uh, a, a Central Asian or Near Eastern, Middle Eastern cat, okay, wild cat. This one is another Central Asian wild cat. This one is from Southern Africa, again, a wild cat. Um, this one is the European wild cat. This one is what's called the Chinese desert cat, again, a wild cat. And this one's called a sand cat. Um, and it was already known that the sand cat is sort of uh, more distantly related to all of these. Okay? And so the same kind of study was done. You get DNA from all of these guys, and then you figure out where to place those guys on that tree. Okay? And so that was done, and that's the tree. Okay? And you can notice some interesting things. So the first is, again, just by reading off uh, the tree, you can tell which one of these wild cats gave rise to domesticated cats. Okay? Um, it wasn't the Chinese desert cat. It wasn't the European wild cat. It wasn't the Southern African wild cat. Um, it was a Central Asian or Near Eastern wild cat, because those are the close branches on this tree. And in fact, if you look at this part of the tree right here, it includes the house cats and some of the Middle Eastern cats. Okay? And so again, just by seeing that, you say, OK, so domesticated cats came from wild cats that were like this one that were living in the Middle East. Okay? The other thing we notice about this tree is that the dates are much longer than they are for dogs. Okay? So as I said, dogs were domesticated around the time that human civilization started to coalesce, about 15,000 years ago. The dates on this tree are almost 10, or more in some cases, than 10 times that long. Okay? 131,000 years ago for the common ancestor of all uh, house cats and these wild cats. 173,000 years ago, 230,000 years ago for the common ancestor of all of these guys. Okay, so that doesn't jive with our sense of when domestication should take place. Um, do we think that sort of our distant, distant, distant human relatives um, were domesticating cats? Well, that's kind of implausible, especially since modern humans, if you put the date for modern humans on this tree, um, it's only 50 to 100,000 years. Okay, so who was it that was you know, doing the domestication? It wasn't humans. Um, it could have been human ancestors, but that is, is kind of implausible. So, what, so what, what could that mean? What it probably means is that the wild cats diversified a really long time ago. It was the wild cats that were diversifying you know, this long ago, this long ago, and this long ago. And this set of Middle Eastern wild cats, okay, which sort of became its own group, separated from the rest about 130,000 years ago, continued to diversify. And so there are probably multiple lineages of these Middle Eastern wildcats that exist. And then each of those lineages has somehow, somehow contributed to modern cats. Okay? So the domestication of, of modern cats indeed took place when we thought it would take place, which is about 15,000 years ago. Okay? But that event was not sort of taking a small number of wolves and turning them into dogs. It was independent events of domestication that then by interbreeding became the sort of genetic, the gene pool of modern house cats. 
Right, so it's just in sort of where these things are. So these are sort of separated populations. You have East Asian ones, you have European ones, you have South African ones, and then everything from here up is either a domesticated cat or a Central Asian, Near Eastern, basically Middle Eastern cat, a wild cat. The other interesting difference between dogs and cats, right, is that if you think about the domestication of dogs, it was probably very intentional, okay? Intentional in the sense that uh, wolves are sort of social creatures. Um, it was clear that they could perform functions that might be useful to humans, like helping hunt or retrieve things that had been hunted. Um, it, it's not so implausible to think of those early associations between humans and wolves uh, leading to sort of someone sort of taking a wolf in, that wolf becoming sort of friendly, making a pet and a, and a helper out of it. And indeed, there have been experiments done where you can take wolves and, and basically domesticate them in, in sort of in, a life, in less than a lifetime, right, um, by breeding for ones that are more docile and so on. Cats, as anyone who's ever met a cat knows, um, don't go for that, right? Uh, wild cats especially tend to be carnivores. Um, they tend to be loners. Um, they don't really behave the way you want them to. Even domesticated cats don't. They're sort of on their own. And so it's thought that the domestication of cats was actually a very different type of event than the domestication of, of dogs in that it was probably not by human intention that it happened. What's thought to have happened is that humans started living in towns, um, and there was uh, that attracted very, and they started growing wheat and other crops, which we'll get to later in the course. And they started storing those things, and then ro rodents came around, okay, and started eating the things that the humans had stored and causing disease for the humans because the rodents were now in association with the, the human food. The cats were attracted to the rodents, okay? They got a lot of food out of the rodents. The humans noticed that the cats were taking care of the rodents and didn't mind having the cats around. And so what you have is sort of this almost not artificial breeding of, of a wild cat into a cat, but you have this sort of natural breeding, natural selection of cats to have certain behaviors, like more likely to associate with where humans are, going for rodents that uh, are associated with grain that's been stored and so on. And it was probably only much later that cats were actually turned into pets, okay? And the earliest records of sort of the, I don't know what you call it, glorification of cats um, are from ancient Egypt, which is not that distant in the past, you know, just a you know, few thousand years ago. Um, where it was clear that cats were living with humans and, and humans were sort of revering cats. Um, and so probably for me several thousand years, it was just sort of this toleration of cats um, that started off this domestication process. Any questions about that before I go on to another a kind of cool example of, of really weird looking dogs that, uh, where we can tell where they came from? Any questions about that? Okay. So, all right, on to some really strange dogs. Okay, so there are dogs that are living in um, parts of the Americas that are strange looking, okay? And there's archeological <laughs> evidence that there were domesticated dogs in Europe and in the Americas before Columbus, basically, before exploration, colonization of the Americas took place, okay? And so as we know now that dogs were domesticated from the gray wolf, which is found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And so the question is, where did these new world dogs come from, these American dogs come from? Were they European dogs that a long time ago came with ancient humans when there was a land bridge between far, far, far uh, Eastern Asia, um, Siberia, basically, and, and the Americas uh, up by Alaska? Or was it an independent thing? You know, maybe here in the Americas, people figured out that they could domesticate wolves, and they made their own dogs out of that, 
Um, and then in Europe, people figured that out too, and, and Middle East fi people figured that out too and got different dogs out. Okay? And so we could actually um, we can use DNA again to answer this question by asking who are the relatives of these dogs. Right? And I said before that we usually don't have access to ancestors because they died sometime in the past and they're forgotten and lost. Um, but in the case of New World dogs, we actually have them. Um, and the reason we have them is that some New World societies, pre-Columbus, um, mummified their dogs and buried them with humans. Okay? So, for example, in the Peabody Museum at Harvard, there are um, dogs, right, that are pre-Columbian dogs that were mummified in these kind of makeshift sacks, right, but preserved in such a way that you can still see they had fur, they had short stubby legs. Um, they're intact, basically. So you can actually get DNA out of these things, right, even though they're hundreds of years old. Um, and you can ask the question, who are they, right? Uh, and the way we ask that question genetically is we put those sequences into the mix and we draw a tree and we ask who's related to who. Okay? So this is how you do it. You take a bunch of dogs that are relevant here. So you take sort of modern dogs, the same dogs that were in the previous study. Those on this tree are labeled with a D. Uh, modern coyotes um, are labeled LA uh, from their Latin name. Okay? And what you can see is here uh, the coyotes again just fall out in a very, very different part of the tree from all the dog and the wolf sequences, as you would expect. We have modern Eurasian wolves, which are LU, okay, and those are all the black ones here. Um, we, we get some more samples, which are modern American wolves. Okay, those are LUs that are in blue. And we get some ancient dogs. Okay, so in green, we have some new dog samples that are actually um, Ancient dogs from Alaska, those are preserved because they're under ice. Okay? It's as if they were stuck in the freezer for a few hundred years. And we have some ancient dogs from Latin America, and those are preserved because humans actually preserved them and, and, and mummified them. Okay? So now what we do is we take all of these sequences and we build our tree, and we see what the tree shows. Okay? And so what would we expect to see if for example, these ancient dogs from Latin America were an independent domestication event from North American wolves. What would we expect to see? We'd expect to see two things. So the question is, ignore that this tree is up here, right? And I'm asking you to imagine what the tree would look like if the ancient Latin American dogs actually came from a domestication event that was independent from the European one. Basically, that there were North American wolves that were domesticated to become these ancient Latin American dogs, or Latin American wolves. Um, and there were Eurasian wolves that were domesticated to become the standard dogs that we, that we know of. Okay? So what would that tree look like if there were sort of these independent domestication events? Yeah, so you'd expect to see that there would be a branch of the tree that contained these ancient Latin American dogs, and its most close relative on the tree would be an American wolf. Okay? And you'd expect to see the American wolves forming like a tight set of branches too, separate from the European wolf. Okay? And that, from that branch would emerge this ancient dog and this ancient dog from the American wolves, yeah, okay? And so that's not actually what we see, right? So if we look at where the American wolves are, um, they're in a few places on the tree, okay? The American wolves don't sort of fall out as a separate group from the rest of the European wolves. That suggests that those two populations are not really independent from one another, okay? That, that you have two populations um, that are sort of divided by geography, but at least in the recent past, very recent past, they must have been intermixing, okay? Because the, um, 
close relatives of these American wolves are <coughs> European wolves. Okay, and there are a few examples of that, and you don't get this tight cluster of just the American wolves separate from the European wolves. And then where are the ancient dogs on the tree? Well, the ancient dogs are all up here. So they're the ones in, in the purple and the green. right? Um, and they're all in this set of branches that's coming out of these. Okay, So the closest relative of all of these branches, and so I'm looking at all these branches because these are the ones that contain all of the ancient dog samples. The closest relatives of those are these. Okay, and those are all European wolves, right? Um, and the other part of that, right, is that the part of the tree that has all of the ancient ones, the, the purple and the green, has all the regular ones too. Okay, it has all the, the regular black dog samples. Okay, so that tells us that there wasn't an independent domestication event in the Americas that gave rise to these dogs, and so. Um, the most likely explanation of this pattern that we see is that these ancient dogs were already dogs when they got to North America. Okay? They weren't wolves that were domesticated into dogs. They were already dogs in Alaska, in Latin America, and they came with the people who were crossing the Bering Strait um, and populating North America and then Latin America um, afterwards. Okay? So this is basically the evidence um, of, uh, of where those dogs came from. And, and it's interesting because if you do the timing on this, the timing is exactly right for when our ancestors, basically Native Americans, first arrived um, from across the Bering Strait. OK, so that's what I just said. Basically. Looking at that tree, we can make an anthropological statement, right? Which is that um, the domesticated dogs from Eurasia must have accompanied humans across the Bering Strait about 12,000 or 14,000 years ago. Okay, but if you look a little bit closer at the tree, one of the things you see is that some of the dog DNA types that are from the ancient dogs are clustering together, and they're not found in any modern dog. Okay, And so what that suggests is that that dog breed existed, okay, but it doesn't have any modern relatives. Okay? So 10,000 years ago, those dogs were in Latin America. Um, up until you know, hundreds of years ago, pre-Columbus, those dogs were there. Um, but there's no dog that we can point to today that is a sort of current descendant of those dogs, right? Um, because otherwise, you'd expect to see some of these black D sequences mixed in with those dogs, and we don't. Okay, So um, that suggests something funny is going on. And one of the examples of such a dog okay, um, is what's called the Mexican hairless dog, another really weird looking dog. Okay, um, It has just basically a mohawk on its head, but the rest of it doesn't have any hair. Um, and it gets cold, so it wears a jacket. Um, so if you look at the archaeological evidence, those, those dogs, dogs that looked like this existed um, a very long time ago, so pre-Columbus. right? You can dig up remains of dogs that look like this um, from pre-1400. Okay? And so those so what you would expect then is that, you know, and, and, and that archaeology is good. You can say, you know, it, those dogs basically look like these dogs. Okay? Um, but then if you take the DNA from one of these dogs, which is obviously a modern dog, right? This is not a mummy. Um, you take this dog's DNA, it doesn't match this DNA. Okay? So um, what does that mean? It, well, it means one of two things. One possible thing is this dog is a fraud. Right? And we'll get back to another dog fraud in a future lecture. But the idea being that um, modern humans, sort of post-Columbus, uh, reinvented this dog. Okay? There was some lore of Mexican hairless dogs that were sort of pre-1400. Um, Europeans colonized and you know, 
destroyed everything, including those uh, ancient dog breeds, right? And someone had some uh, sort of nostalgia for those dogs, so they recreated them, right? And just by selective breeding again, you get a dog breed that looks very much like the ancient breed, okay? But the DNA tells the story, right? The DNA says it's not the ancient breed uh, because this dog's DNA doesn't fit up here. It fits somewhere over here, okay? Um, and so, um, in a sense, these dogs would then be a fraud. The, the other explanation is that this poor guy is not a fraud, okay? Um, but when the Eurasian dogs came over again, right? So you have the first migration across the Bering Strait over 10,000 years ago, and then you had another migration, if you want to be generous and call it a migration, a few hundred years ago, you know, with the uh, sort of European colonization of the New World, and all the dogs came over again, that there was then interbreeding between the European dogs and these ancient American dogs. Um, but people were careful. They said, okay, well, you're, you know, your German Shepherd just mated with my Mexican hairless, okay? And we get these mutts, but some of them still look a little bit like this guy, so I'm gonna keep those, because I want my Mexican hairless, right? Um, and so um, it's possible that what happened then is that the female lineage sort of is European, but there's still a lineage there that were, that were actually the ancient dogs. Right? Do you see how that works? Right? If you have this interbreeding, right, all we're reading here is the mitochondria, so all we're reading is the maternal lineage. The maternal lineage, is, the maternal lineage tells us these dogs are European. They're not ancient American. Okay? But it could have been that there was a lot of interbreeding going on and continual selection so that the breed still looks the way it did a few hundred years ago. And by doing that generation after generation, eventually you get back to what's a pure breed Okay, so Mexican hairless giving rise to Mexican hairless, but its DNA is still a mutt. Okay, its DNA came from some of those ancient dogs, it came from some of the uh, European dogs, and in particular, the mitochondrial DNA, the female lineage was European. Okay, but some, some of the male lineage, lineage could be actually still the ancient American. And so how would you actually figure out which which of those is true. How would you figure out that this was a fraud versus sort of this selected breed that, that survived this intermingling with the European? Uh, you can analyze the likelihood. So the, definite, so the next definite thing you'd want to do is to look at the Y chromosome, OK? Because that would at least give you the paternal lineage, right? And the prediction might be that even though the maternal lineage tells a European story, the paternal lineage might tell a, um, that there's real, still ancient uh, American dog DNA in there. Um, but remember that in terms of sort of your, think of yourself, right? Think of your history, right? If you just take your completely maternal lineage, that's your mother, your mother's mother, your mother's mother's mother, and if you just take your completely paternal lineage, your father, your father's father, your father's father's father, that's a very small proportion of your entire ancestry, right? And the farther you go back in time, it becomes an even smaller pr proportion of your ancestry. So if you think about it as your maternal and paternal lineage in your parents, that's 100% of your ancestry, okay? In your grandparents, if you only take your mother's mother and your father's father, that's half of your ancestry. In your great-grandparents, it's only Yes. In your great-great-grandparents, it's only, right? And so the farther you go back, if you only consider the maternal lineage and the paternal lineage, you're missing more and more and more of your ancestry, OK? So let's say if the Y chromosome data looked exactly like this, would we then be able to conclude it's a fraud as opposed to not having any ancient American ancestry? No, because if we go back you know, to 1400, that's many, many dog <coughs> generations, right? And so 
the maternal lineage and the, the strictly maternal lineage and the strictly paternal lineage, if you go back that far, is a very, very small percentage of the total possible ancestry of these animals. Okay? So what else would you have to do to actually complete the story? Beyond mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. What other DNA is there? Mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome. Is there any other DNA? Regular, regular, regular DNA, right? All of the other chromosomes, right? The X chromosome, which travels through males and females. All of the autosomes, so the second chromosome, the third chromosome, all 23 chromosomes, okay? So if you really, in us, I don't, I don't actually know how many chromosomes dogs have, but let's say it's somewhere around 20. Um, you'd have to look at basically their whole genome, right? And as I said, if there was this interbreeding going on, then their genome is a mutt, right? Their genome is going to come from this place and that place and this place. Um, and you should actually be able to see that if you've got all of the DNA sequences of their entire genome, okay? This is an important concept to remember because when we talk later in the course about human ancestry, it was the same sort of pattern of studies. So you start with mitochondrial DNA as being the easiest and the first thing people look at. But again, that only tells the story of the strictly maternal lineage. Okay? And then the Y chromosome, be, be, which is the second most easy, straightforward thing to look at. Um, and we'll talk about something called the Genographic Project, which you might have heard of, where you can sort of get your own DNA, send it over to National Geographic, and then they fit you into this whole sort of migratory pattern on Earth. But all they look at is mitochondrial DNA of females and mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome of males. Okay? And so they're only getting these sort of slices of your ancestry. And if you want your full ancestry, you need the full genome. Okay? All right, let's leave it at that.